ECLS stands for Extracorporeal Life Support, um, which is uh, which is basically a system that we use in patients who have very advanced disease of the lungs or heart, uh, and uh, it uh, it basically provides uh, support to the lung and or the heart uh, in those circumstances. The other term that is often used is um, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO and that's probably the term that that is more widely used but ECLS is probably a broader term under which ECMO would fall. Typically uh, it would be patients who have heart uh, and or lung failure that is quite advanced to the point where the more standard treatments uh, are not sufficient. In other words, the first step for these patients would typically be that uh, they receive medications or they're placed on a ventilator uh, and other supportive measures are used. But once you get to the point where those measures are not enough, then um, extracorporeal life support uh, might be something that is beneficial. There's a, a, a pump that lies outside of the body uh, that is going to pump blood into the body. So there has to be a connection between that pump uh, and the patient's own bloodstream. Uh, and there's usually a couple of connections, one in which the blood is being drained or removed from the body to the pump and then another which is simultaneously returning blood from the pump to the body. The, oftentimes uh, there will be uh, an artificial lung attached to the pump uh, which uh, is adding the oxygen and removing the carbon dioxide and that's the portion that uh, is particularly useful in patients who have lung failure. For most patients, the idea would be that if they come in with the advanced heart or lung failure, that we place them on, on ECMO or ECLS, uh, and then we give the heart and or lungs a time period to recover. Uh, and as they recover function, we would hopefully be able to remove the ECMO over time. ECMO or ECLS doesn't directly treat the heart or the lungs, Basically what it does it, uh, is that it allows the heart or the lungs time to recover and supports the heart or the lungs and the body during that period of time when they're, when they're recovering. The chances of survival with ECMO if you consider you know, all patients who are placed on ECMO would be about 50%. Uh, so there's still, you know, that's far from perfect, uh, but for patients in whom, you know, who are really critical to that point, uh, it, it offers them a chance. Because the blood is passing through an, uh, an artificial tubing and a machine, uh, the blood has a tendency to form clots within the tubing in the machine. Uh, and if it does, that can either clot up the machine, which is obviously problematic. Uh, and uh, in addition, those clots can go to other places within the body uh, and cause problems over there, such as strokes or problems with the blood flow to really any of the organs within the body. Because of that, we often have to use blood thinners while people are on uh, these uh, support devices. Uh, and unfortunately, that then creates a risk of bleeding. So on the one hand, there's some risk of blood clot formation with the, with the pump. And on the other hand, once we introduce blood thinners, there's also a risk of bleeding. We wouldn't initiated it unless we had come to the point where we didn't really have any other viable option uh, and so certainly we wouldn't consider using ECMO or ECLS for patients who don't meet fairly strict criteria because of the potential problems associated with the treatment itself.
This is so. This is really a team effort, uh, and uh, that's one of the things that is really sort of uh, um, exciting for us as physicians uh, taking care of complex patients because we get to interact with so many other really uh, bright and smart people. Broadly speaking, the people that will be involved are uh, physicians such as cardiologists and pulmonologists. They're uh, critical care intensivists, so doctors who are specialized at taking care of critical care, critically ill patients. Uh, there are surgeons such as uh, uh, myself and other heart or lung surgeons. There are excellent group of critical care nurses, uh, respiratory therapists. Uh, there are perfusionists who manage the blood pump or the ECMO circuit itself. And then there are a host of other therapists, nutritionists, uh, pharmacists, etc., who work uh, with the ICU team in managing these critically ill patients. While patients are on ECMO, they are being continuously monitored in the ICU. Uh, these are complex patients and there are a number of teams of uh, doctors involved in taking care of them. Uh, and so there'll be almost daily discussions amongst the teams uh, about the direction of care. Uh, ECMO is continued uh, while patients are making progress without complications, uh, but some patients may not progress or they may develop complications uh, and in those cases after this after discussion the team will decide to discontinue ECMO. Once we see signs that those organs are recovering that's the point at which we sort of try to scale back the amount of support that is coming from the ECMO pump or circuit. As we scale that back uh, what we hope to see is that the uh, patients own heart and or lungs are taking over the role that they would normally be doing. What that entails is sort of a gradual scaling back on the machine uh, and reassessment of how the patient's doing. Discontinuing the, uh, the ECLS is, is a procedure. Sometimes it's a procedure that is done at the bedside. Sometimes it's a procedure that needs to be done in the operating room, but it is a procedure just as initiating it was a procedure. There's no real specific time period for uh, how long somebody can be on uh, ECMO or ECLS. Uh, it really depends on the needs of the patient. On the flip side, if things are going well and uh, we seem to be stable or making progress and not having problems, then there's not really a specific time period uh, or set point after which we have to stop it.